I am very thankful for this church building, not the, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is there is proof that this building was built by a competent architect according to the codes of safety for our city. I'm holding one of the original designs for our building that was signed by the Macaulay Architect Company in February of 1990. Our church has existed for 42 years. We've been in this building for about 32 years. And here's proof that the chairs on which you are sitting will not collapse into the basement because we know that the architect built the building according to the codes of safety. You know why that's important, don't you? Because if a building is not built according to code, people die. Lives are risked. But I'm glad to tell you that God also follows a blueprint for living the Christian life, and it's fail-proof. If you follow God's blueprint, you will not be disappointed. Your life will not collapse. You'll be able to experience all the promises that Jesus made. And God's blueprint includes now and forever. It includes an abundant life now and the promise of an eternal life in his presence in a wonderful place called heaven. I want to study it with you in God's word. Grab your Bibles and join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to read the first 10 verses for you. In a message, I'm simply calling God's blueprint for heaven. This is our third message, focusing on the promise of heaven, and what that means to us as believers, and the impact it should have on us now. I know Jerry McKenzie teases me that I say every Sunday, this is my favorite text of God's Word, but this really is one of my favorites because it's the passage God used to arrest me as a confused teenager and send me into the ministry as a preacher of the gospel. This text, more than any passage of God's word, has shaped my philosophy of, my, of ministry and my understanding of who God is and what he wants to do in the world. But I'm focusing this morning on the first ten verses. And as always, every Sunday I say it, the reading of God's word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it because this is the word of the living God. But the problem in saying it every Sunday is that it just becomes a ritual for a lot of people. But I need you to know that I believe it to the core of my being. I have experienced the power and authority of the word of God in my own journey this word is God's word to transform lives. It's his promise to you. And so let's read it with the respect it deserves. I love the way Paul starts. For we know the world hates conviction. The Bible teaches us to have a backbone. We know. We're not guessing. Why do we know? Because God has told us that if the tent, the tent is a reference to your body. I like that. If the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan. Watch what he says. Why do we groan? We're groaning because we are longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed. We're not wanting to die. We're not looking forward to dying. But he says, so that uh, we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Verse 5 tells us where this all comes from. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God. Who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. Now notice what he says is our response. Because we know this, we are always full of good courage. We have good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our motivation, our ambition, our aim. I love this. It's the most liberating statement in the New Testament. 
Our aim is to please Jesus, to please him. Now notice how he goes from pleasing him to the judgment seat. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Evil. A Christian doing evil? Well, it must be possible because he's talking to Christians here. So let me show you God's blueprint for heaven. Number one, we believers are always longing for heaven. We have a deep desire for heaven. We're desiring to put on our heavenly dwelling. I love that word longing. It speaks about the deepest needs or uh, 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 the, the, the spiritual appetites of your heart. It's the same word that the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, used to translate Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs after you, O God. That's the same word that Paul uses when he talks about believers are longing for home. We're homesick. Our hearts are aching to be where God promises we are going. Isn't it interesting that we could deduce from this passage that Jesus Christ rewrites and reassigns our longings. He changes what we want and what we desire, what we're striving after. I would, I would claim that to be one of the simplest definitions of what it means to be a Christian. God has changed what I want. <laughs> the things I used to pursue with such passion no longer hold sway over my life. I long for what God longs for. My heart has been changed to desire what God desires. That's a mark of a growing Christian. That's a sign of being a Christian. Ah, if you don't have any desire to read God's word, there's a problem. If you have no inclination to pray, if worship to you could take it or leave it, if telling people about Jesus is not on your priority, you got to wonder about your longings and your desires. So when Paul talks about the Christian life, he says, we live here now in the body, always with a bit of a heartache for home. Wanting to be in that amazing place. I recently heard John Mark Comer say that your deepest desires are not necessarily your strongest desires. And it made a lot of sense to me. Because I often say to God, if I'm your child, why do I still have such strong desires for what I know displeases you? Comer is right. Your strongest desires may not be your deepest desires because for the believer, the deepest desire is longing for fellowship with the Lord, desiring heaven, desiring the immortal life that he has for us. Now notice carefully in the first four verses what he does. He simply talks about the old house and the new house. I think it's rather simple. He's talking about the house of our body that we live in and he calls it a tent. So... If you live in a tent, you have no fixed address, and you're considered homeless in much of the world, though you can go to the Middle East, and you'll meet nomadic people and shepherds who live in tents. But by and large, if you're living in North America in a tent, you're considered homeless, because a tent is meant to be a temporary escape, a temporary dwelling, and it's very vulnerable. A tent is not a safe protection from the flood waters and the heavy winds that blow against it. So he says, just keep in mind, will you, that this is your body. It's temporary and it's vulnerable and eventually it's going to be folded up. It's going to be destroyed. What a great word for the body. Elsewhere, in fact, just earlier in the previous chapter, Paul talked about the body as a jar of clay. Isn't that cool? So he talks about your body like a tent. It's temporary and it's vulnerable. You're at risk to more than just a cold. And eventually, one of those diseases will fold your tent up. Then he says, I think of you like a jar of clay. And there's this great treasure inside. The treasure is the new, the new identity in Christ. The Holy Spirit. And he's speaking specifically of the gospel. We're 
We are the repositories of the gospel, like jars of clay. I love that. So he said, the, the old house is a tent that you're living in. You notice that your tent's getting older? When you first had it, it was brand new and there were no wrinkles. Now the tent has all kinds of wrinkles on it, right? It's getting, it's getting older. But notice what he says about the tent. It is your earthly home. I don't know about your home, but in my home, respect is the rule of our living together. Home is a safe place where you know that you will be loved and cherished and respected. So we don't allow shouting at each other. You can't slam doors. You can't tell people off. People know in my home, if you gossip at dinner, dad will change the subject. And if you don't change the subject, dad will change you to another room. There's no gossip. There's no backbiting. I want my home to be a godly home, a safe and decent place for our family to exist. So I think he's saying, treat your body with some respect. Eat better than you do. Get yourself a treadmill. Buy a pair of sneakers. Hike, bike, run, play hockey, play soccer. Keep the body healthy. Eat well, sleep well. Get your Sabbath away from the pressures of life. I get one day off a week. And on that day, I shut my phone off and I stick it in the drawer. And my wife and I try to get away. And the only distractions I allow are crisis and emergencies at the church. But that's the only day a week I get, and we have rules. We don't talk about church. We don't talk about theology. We talk about fun things. We laugh. We eat good food. We go out of town. We try to find a good park to have a picnic and enjoy ourselves. So it's the tent. Paul calls it your home. Treat your home with respect because you're going to be in it for a little while. If you don't, you won't be in it as long. He says about your tent, it's going to be destroyed. The word, Greek word is dissolved here. I couldn't help but think about the, my childhood home back in a small village called McGivney, New Brunswick. Our home was a very humble home. It was built on cedar posts it rested on the ground it didn't have any basement and so after the heaving of the winter frost one of us when you got old enough would have to climb under and dig out a hole a, a, a hole for another one of the posts and put it in place and try to use some shimmies to lift it up a little bit and somebody would holler from upstairs we can close the door again it's level it's balanced so after I grew up and went away, I went back to that, the location of my childhood home, and uh, it had dissolved, it had faded completely into the forest. After we moved out, it succumbed to the elements, it eventually dissolved, fell apart, and was covered by the forest. That's what will happen to our bodies. It's going back into the ground. It's dissolving back to the Ashes from which God formed it, waiting the day of the great resurrection. That's the old body. It's a good concept. Take care of your body as much as you can. But notice what he says. He compares the old house with the new house. He says, when the old one is dissolved, we have a new building made by God. How cool is that? It's made by God himself. It's the new identity we have in Christ, and it's our new body from which we will serve him. Then he gives us a very encouraging word of who designed it and who made it. He said, it's not made with human hands. Are you frustrated at times like I am when you go and buy an expensive, uh, an expensive gift that you've wanted for a while? You pay good money for it, you get it home, and it's broken. You try to send it back and they won't take it back. You paid good money and you... You know what happened? When, whenever you put human hands to human work, it results in imperfection, in failure. But when it comes to the new body and the hope that you have in Christ, it is God himself who has shaped it with his very own perfect hands. And he says it's eternal in the heavens. You know, I'm not being unkind now. You all have an expiration date. 
And it's probably much sooner than you're giving credit to. We don't know, do we? But you really don't expire. Because God says, as soon as this tent is dissolved, you're going home to an eternal life. This sounds arrogant, and if it wasn't for the gospel, it would be a foolish statement. I have no plans whatsoever to die. None. When you hear that Derek Bartlett has died, don't you believe it? I tell Christian families all the time at the graveside of their loved ones, don't you believe what your eyes are telling you? You believe what God tells you. Absent from the body is present with the Lord, and you have taken up eternal life in the presence of the God who made you. Are you longing for that beautiful place? Are you longing for that fellowship with Christ? That's what Paul says heaven is meant to do for us. It changes our eternal affections. Number two, we're groaning for heaven in verses two through four. I'm choosing my words carefully here because Paul is not saying that living on earth in these bodies is a groaning disappointment. He's not saying that. He's actually saying that our groaning is because we are longing for heaven. We're not moaning and whining and complaining because our lives are so miserable. Because that's not the philosophy of the Christian life. This hope is the hope that gives us great strength in the most difficult of circumstances. And we're not waiting to die and anxious to die and suffer. But Paul uses the word groaning to compare to the idea that he just used of longing for heaven. Here's what he's saying, compared to heaven. You listening to me, church family? Compared to heaven, living in this body away from the Lord is a real groaning experience. It's because of what awaits us, what is before us. We know that God has a different plan for us, a greater plan some of you, I can see some of you arguing in your mind that doesn't Paul talk about the sufferings of this present time? He sure does. And the Bible is frank about the reality that we're going to suffer all kinds of mishaps, uh, all kinds of trouble and difficulties in this life. But what encourages us is the promise of what is ahead. We are always in triumphant procession. In Christ, we're always victorious in Christ. So, if we groan, it's not complaining. Many of us groan quite a bit. But our groaning is criticizing. Our groaning is moaning and whining about the state of our lives. Or about our status in life. That's not what God's talking about. You need to stop your groaning. You know that the Bible says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So Paul's not saying, go ahead and groan about your miserable experiences. You're groaning knowing that heaven awaits you. That you have everything you need in Christ. And then, of course, he makes that famous statement when he talks about our groaning in this life where the mortal is swallowed up by life. Just think about the imagery in that statement. Throughout all of human history, we have buried our loved ones in the ground. We have dug holes and watched them drop down into the earth and covered them over with soil as though death has swallowed up life. Paul takes that image and says, God has reversed the curse of our sin and death so that now when you pass when we drop your body into the grave, the picture in our mind is life is swallowing up death. Your perishable body is being transformed into the imperishable body. You know that passage, don't you, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I love to read it at Christian funerals. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, listen carefully, and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. 
So as a Christian, you're teaching yourself, training yourself, reminding yourself to be longing for heaven and groaning for heaven. Let me show you thirdly in this passage. The key to it all is in verse number five. We're trusting in the God of heaven. Paul tells us what is ahead for every Christian and how it should affect our desires and longings. And then he said, it is God who, who wrote this plan. This is God's blueprint. God is the source. God is the architect of this great eternal plan that involves giving you a place in his presence. This isn't the product of the imagination of man. This is not something we created, some philosopher wrote. Paul says, don't you forget it. That's where the key comes. Your confidence is in the one who wrote this plan and the one who is executing this plan. I get to preach this afternoon to the Arabic congregation. I'm preaching on the importance of unity in Philippians chapter 1. And I'm going to end with that verse in verse 6 where he says, He who began a good work in you will finish it, complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I can't wait to remind them that it's a good work, but it's God's work. You are God's work. Your salvation is God's work. He's the architect. And he gives us a down payment. So we're sure the down payment is his Holy Spirit. By whom and into whom you were baptized at the moment of your salvation. From whom you are to receive a continual filling in your life. As Paul says in Ephesians 6, be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. So you're baptized and you're filled and the Bible says you are led. If you are led by the Spirit of God, then you are the sons of God. What does being led by the Spirit look like? I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. I've gotten into the habit now of when I buy something, I check where it's made first. And I have certain manufacturers that I trust their product. That's all we're saying about eternal life. You don't just trust any religious guru or preacher or teacher on television or radio or authors. You check to make sure it came from God's source, his word. Is it in the scriptures? Doesn't come from a church, a minister, a priest or a rabbi. It comes from God. I just love that verse. What this is comes from God, Paul says. And he gave you the Holy Spirit so you No, it's the Holy Spirit who witnesses with your spirit that you are the sons and daughters of God. So you know you're part of God's great plan. How do we know it? Paul says it in the text, by faith. He says it's God who designed it and God who executes it, and our part is to walk by faith, not by sight. Don't walk by your feelings, your impressions, your perceptions, your own wisdom, walk by faith. What does that mean? Listening to God's word and listening for the Spirit's leadership in my life. Test what you think is God's will. The Lord will show you. Walking by faith means I really don't know from one day to the next what's going to happen. I don't know if I will live or die. That's Paul's whole point. He's saying, I can be content if I'm in the body, or if I'm in the body, though, I'm away from the Lord. I'd rather be with the Lord. But he says, either way, living here or dying and going to be with Jesus, I'm going to accept it by faith. See, the Christian is under divine orders that when a tragedy or difficulty or challenge comes in your life, you step back and take a deep breath and process your ragged emotions And then say to the Lord, but I know you are the architect of my life. I know you are the perfecter of all that I believe and I will commit my life into your hands. It's not my life to manage. It's your life to manage, Lord. It's yours, so help me to be obedient. Just give me strength. Do you know how many times I've said to God, I would have rather had a different childhood? And he said, you have the one I gave you. Stored it well. Stored it the way I want you to. 
That honors him. We're trusting. How? By faith. Just believe him. Believe what he says in his word. What is the sign that you are trusting him by faith? You have courage. You're bold as a lion, the Bible says. You're bold. You don't doubt and wonder. You have great confidence in God. It's the same word that Paul used, uh, Paul or the author of Hebrew, Hebrews used in Hebrews 13 verse 5. Uh, the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. What do I need to fear that man can do to me? That's the same word for courage. Have a backbone, man. Have a backbone, lady. For God's glory, for Christ's sake, for the truth's sake. Where does that come from? From the Lord and from faith. Are you still with me, church family? I can't tell. Some of you look really, really sober this morning. It's scaring me. Number four, I'll finish with this. Paul says, we long for heaven, we groan for heaven, we're trusting in the God of heaven, and then he lands in verses 9 and 10 by saying, you need to be preparing for heaven because the inspection time is coming. You know my heart on this. If you haven't heard it, hear it again, please. He finishes verse 8 by telling us, by reminding us that the goal of every Christian is to please the Lord Jesus. And then he moves into the explanation of the judgment seat of Christ. So the impetus and motivation, the drive in the heart of every Christian is to do what we know will honor Jesus, that will please the Lord, that will bring him great glory. He's talking about your motivation here. Do you do what you do to be seen of men? Or do you do what you do imagining his countenance beaming upon you? Just that he is pleased. That word is used eight times in the New Testament. It speaks about pleasing him with our bodies, pleasing him with our sacrifice of service, pleasing him uh, in, a, in, in our obedience. But Hebrews tells us that we can only please him with the good works through Jesus Christ. It's the most liberating concept for you, especially those of you who are really stuck in the opinions of others about you. If you can be released to know that there's only one person you need to honor, that's Jesus. Just one person. That's easy. I can do what he is pleased with, what will honor him. So when... Someone fires a harsh criticism at you at work, at home, in the church, another Christian, and it sticks. Has that ever happened to you? A criticism sticks and it gets you down and you feel burdened by it. I'm sure that happens to you. If you're human, it happens to all of you. So I was reading the other day after experiencing that because I'm human too. And I was literally reading in the book of Colossians, the end of the book, and Paul's talking about all of his friends in Colossae, and then he says at the end, matter of fact, almost, almost in a flippant way, and oh, by the way, tell Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Just tell Archippus to be faithful. Honor the Lord. Do what Jesus told him to do. That's easy, isn't it? For us as Christians, what are we doing? What we think, to the best of our faith and ability and discernment, we're doing what pleases the Lord. And what pleases the Lord will most often please and bless others. So notice what he says. Our, our aim, our passion in life is to please him. It's not that. It shouldn't be intimidating. I've been happily, mostly happily married for four, uh, 40 years, 38, 39, uh, somewhere in there. Hope she's not watching on video. <laughs> she's coming to the Arabic service with me today. I appreciate her support. She said, you're getting older, so I need to come and pray you through that third service. <laughs> Nobody ever had to teach me that I needed to please my wife. It doesn't feel like a burden. In fact, I'd be embarrassed if she ever thought I do what I do to try and win some points with her. 
Every time I do something kind, which is a regular occurrence, I'm trying to show her this man loves you with every ounce of his being. And that's what, what it should be like for us with Jesus. I'm doing this because I love you. Not to be seen, not to be popular, not to prove a point. I've been there. But to please him. And then he says, because there will be a day of inspection. One day you're going to give an account to Jesus for what you have done in your body. Good or evil. Evil. What is that? Disobedience. Or whatever you are doing that you know you shouldn't be doing. How does it end? You still have eternal life. But it ends that you have to have, you have, to have a moment of looking Jesus in the eye. And seeing the sadness and the disappointment. When he says, I was so looking forward to giving you a great big crown today. But you blew it. You blew it. You wasted my word. You didn't listen to me. You did what you wanted to do in your body. That's what this text is saying. I'm not stretching it or making it up. The day of accounting is coming for you as a Christian. Who wants to meet Jesus and have to drop their head in shame after what he did for us? I know there's not one of you that wants to do that. So listen to his spirit in any way that he says, this isn't pleasing to the Lord. Drop it. Don't argue over it. Don't complain. Don't write a book about it. Just drop it and say, I'm going to do what pleases my Lord Jesus so that you will have a blast when it's your time to stand in his presence. Amen? Amen? Lord Jesus, our prayer is that we can please you in all things. We invite you to search our hearts, to examine us, show us the ways in which it's still all about us, and train us that you are Lord of our hearts, Lord of our lives, Lord of everything to us, I pray that we will stand before you one day in the bright, exciting anticipation of hearing you say those words. Thank you. Bless you, my child. Well done. So touch the hearts of your people that we may serve you with that high motivation for your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.